Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about IoT fuzzing. Uh, without further ado, let's start. Uh, by 2020, there will be more than 20 billion IoT devices connected to internet, introducing an enormous attack surface. And the security impact of uh, this would be huge. There would be actually, it would be twofold. So first, there would be a privacy issue for end users who would be direct targets for attackers. And second, there would be an implication for other users when the IoT becomes infected and participates in a botnet. And we already uh, saw such examples, such as Mirai botnet or VPN filter or Prolly. So what can we do about it? We can, of course, find IoT devices vulnerabilities using methods such as fuzzing. And with fuzzing, we basically iteratively execute a program with random inputs. But how do we go about executing an IoT program? Uh, the first uh, option is executing on the hardware. Uh, and with that, we have a throughput problem. Basically, uh, because we are executing on the hardware, the hardware is slow, so we get a low throughput, and throughput is very important for fuzzing. Uh, the second option is emulating a program, a user program. And with this, we solve actually the throughput problem, but we would still have compatibility issue. Because for the next program, for the third program, and so on and so forth, we need to come up with our fixes for the emulation. Because inherently, user emulation cannot support, actually, uh, hardware dependencies that IoT programs have. The, the third option is actually emulating full stack. And with that, we get a high compatibility. But again, we are back to square one, which is that we get a low throughput because uh, Full stack emulation is a slow. OK. Uh, so the question for us is, can we fuzz IoT devices with high throughput and high compatibility? Let's take a look at the related work. Uh, the first work is actually Avatar. And Avatar follows a hybrid approach. It emulates the program until there is a hardware request. And in such cases, it forwards the request to real hardware. And because it uses real hardware, it has a low throughput. The second work is IoT Fuzzer, which basically executes on real hardware. And because of that, it again has a low throughput. Further, since their fuzzing is a black box approach, uh, it has a low code coverage. The third work is Fermadyne, uh, which uses emulation. Their throughput is medium. But the main problem with this work is that they cannot find zero-day vulnerabilities, because they only search for known vulnerability patterns. And then there's the next work in NDSS 18, where ba they basically try different uh, techniques. They try emulation, and they also try hardware uh, execution. They conclude that uh, full system emulation gives us the best uh, throughput. But uh, their fuzzing approach is black box. So again, we would have the low code coverage problem. And finally, we have uh, AFL, uh, which is a gray box fuzzer. Uh, it has a very high coverage. It has uh, high throughput. But the main problem with AFL is compatibility. And the reason for that is because AFL is based on user mode emulation. And user em mode emulation fails for IoT uh, programs. Uh, this is basically because uh, when there is a hardware dependency, user mode em emulation cannot resolve it. So how about replacing uh, AFL user mode emulation with full system uh, emulation? Well, that's a slower. As I said, it has a low throughput. And there are three reasons for that. First of all, uh, the memory address translation in uh, full system emulation is more complicated. Uh, there are actually three layers of uh, translation, and each layer adds an extra overhead. Second, we have the system call emulation, because we want to resolve hardware dependencies. And that adds overhead. And third, we have dynamic code translation that takes more time in the system mode emulation. I don't get into further details because I don't just want to bore you yet. So if you're interested, please go to the paper, uh, read it. Uh, 
And here you can see an example of our measurement for two programs, uh, AFL with system mode emulation and with user mode emulation. And as you can see, this is just an example, but you can see that the execution time is 10 times more in the system mode, meaning that the throughput would be 10 times less. Uh, so, so far I told you that for uh, fuzzing IoT with AFL, we have two options. Either user mode em emulation or full mode emulation. With user mode emulation, we have high throughput. Uh, with full mode emulation, we have high compatibility. But on the downside, with the user mode emulation, we would have low compatibility. And with, with full mode emulation, we would have low throughput. How about combining them? And that's actually the idea behind our augmented process emulation, combining user mode emulation with system mode emulation. And our design goal basically is uh, we want to achieve high transparency, so we don't want any difference in execution between the user mode and system mode, correctness in other words, and we want high efficiency, high throughput, and uh, no overhead or uh, a performance as close as to user mode emulation. We have two assumptions. Uh, the firmware should be, can be correct, uh, correctly emulated in a system emulator, more specifically in uh, system mode QMU. And the firmware uh, runs a POSIX compatible operating system. These are our two assumptions. And a spoiler, uh, on average, uh, we implemented this and on average we actually achieved uh, 8.2 times higher throughput, and we found two zero vulnerabilities. The main challenge in augmented process emulation is a state synchronization. And uh, by state, I mean both CPU and memory states. For CPU state synchronization, uh, it's not very challenging. We can, uh, we can actually copy uh, CPU registers uh, and make sure that in the two, two modes, the values are the same. But for memory state, we, have, we need extra efforts. Before I get into the details, let's actually see what I mean by memory state uh, synchronization. So we have two modes, user mode and full mode, and let's assume that this is the piece of code that we want to run. Uh, what, it, what I mean by memory state synchronization is that a variable like temp0 should point to the same memory location on RAM. And that way we make sure that they have the same value at all times. So how do we go about it and actually make sure that happens? Uh, this figure high level shows our augmented process emulation. As I said, we have two modes, user mode emulation and system mode emulation. In the system mode emulation, we have multiple processes and one of these uh, processes is actually uh, our user mode emulation process. There's a transition between these two modes and they both access the same RAM file. Uh, so about the, uh, how do we do the memory synchronization? Initially, we actually, we are in the bootstrapping phase. We execute in the system mode uh, emulation. We run until reaching a predetermined point, which is actually uh, where we want to start our fuzzing, and we fork from there. And while doing so, we collect the, uh, the mapping from virtual to physical addresses. After reaching the predetermined point, we switch to the user mode. And whenever there is a page fault, we switch mode and go back to the system mode. We handle the page fault in the system mode and make sure that the mapping is as such that both modes see the same view of memory. Well, I'm not gonna go into details, but this is not very intuitive because if you look at the uh, addresses that we have with, for the same variable, you would see different addresses. And this is because we have different translation mechanisms in these two modes. If you're interested, please refer to a uh, paper for further details on how we handle this. Uh, there's an, uh, another challenge, and that is, how do we know that the page fault handling is actually finished, and we can switch back to the user mode? Again, if you're interested, please refer to the paper. After we are done uh, handling page fault, we go back to the user mode, we, uh, we execute until there is a system call. And if there is a system call, again, we switch back to the user mode. Uh, there are further optimizations that uh, 
I don't get into details. Uh, if you're interested, please uh, refer to the paper. We have a lightweight snapshot mechanism. Uh, we preload pre page mapping for uh, code pages. And instead of blindly redirecting every system call, we're actually doing it selectively. Uh, so we implemented our augmented process emulation uh, in a tool called uh, FermAFL. And FermAFL is basically AFL integrated with uh, augmented process emulation. So in AFL, in each iteration of fuzzing, AFL mutates uh, a seed input. Uh, it runs the program with the seed input. It collects the code coverage information. And if there is a new code coverage, it keeps the input. For code coverage collection, AFL relies on binary instrumentation uh, via user mode offered via uh, user mode QMU. And that's our main difference with AFL. We replace uh, the user mode QMU with our augmented process emulation. So initially, as I mentioned, we, are, we have our bootstrapping phase. We fork a process uh, for this iteration of fuzzing. We feed the input, we collect the coverage information, and we decide whether the input is useful, and we keep repeating this. Uh, we evaluated uh, FermAFL, our tool. Uh, our goal was actually evaluating transparency and efficiency of FermAFL. Uh, so for transparency, we actually want to make sure that augmented process emulation uh, gives us correct execution. And for that, we ran nbench on 120 firmware images. We also ran exploits targeting known vulnerabilities. And the result of our evaluation was that the execution result of augmented process emulation is the same as full system emulation. And by that, I mean that the outputs were the same, the system call sequence was the same, and the execution trace also was the same. Uh, so FermAFL has full transparency. Uh, we also measured uh, how efficient FermAFL is. And what you see in these figures is basically uh, each chart uh, presents our measurement for one IoT device. Y-axis reports the number of unique crashes found. And X-axis reports the time in seconds. The blue area is actually our work. Uh, the result of our work, and the red area is the full system emulation. And as you can see, our, uh, our work, which is in blue, uh, outperforms uh, full system emulation in all cases. In most cases, it's 10 times. In a few cases, it's three times. But in all cases, uh, it outperforms all, uh, full system emulation. Uh, what you see here is an area instead of a single line. It's because we do the measurements 10 times and we report lower bound, upper bound, and median. We also measure, uh, measured the overhead of our modifications. Uh, we ran nbench, uh, and we found that there is a 0 to 2 percent overhead uh, on nbench benchmark. We also measured the system call overhead in our implementation using LMBench, and there is between 0 to 10 percent overhead. Uh, we also measured the effectiveness of each of uh, our optimizations separately. Uh, so what you see here is each line presents our measurement for one IoT device. Uh, a and B are basically our baseline uh, without and with this lightweight snapshot mechanism. We actually don't consider lightweight snapshot as one of our contributions, although it's considerable. Our main contribution is from B to C, augmented process emulation, and also in uh, system call uh, redirection, selective system call redirection. We have also a breakdown of the execution time for each measurement. If you're interested, please refer to the paper. Uh, in total, we actually achieve, uh, as I said, 8.2 times higher throughput. Uh, we also found two zero-day vulnerabilities. Uh, both vulnerabilities can be exploited remotely with a GET request. Uh, there are uh, memory overflow vulnerabilities. And it's actually interesting how fast we could find these vulnerabilities. What we did was letting Fuzzer run uh, to find the one-day vulnerabilities and give it in, give it, it, uh, giving it one extra hour after it found the one-day vulnerabilities. 
and it could find these vulnerabilities. It's interesting because with uh, full system emulation, we couldn't find any vulnerabilities even in 24 hours. Our, so our tool is open source, so please go ahead, download it, use it for your fuzzing purposes. Uh, if uh, you want to use it for search purposes. Uh, <clears throat> And in conclusion, what I told you about is that AFL fails on IoT firmware because of the user mode emulation. Full system emulation is slow. Uh, we introduced firm AFL, which is actually AFL combined with augmented process emulation. And augmented process emulation is basically combining user and system mode emulation, letting the emulation run in user mode unless there is a hardware dependency. Uh, I showed that Ferm AFL is fast and transparent, and Ferm AFL found two zero-day vulnerabilities. Thank you very much. We have time for a few questions for Ali. Uh, let me start off by just asking a quick question. So um, I'm, I'm trying to get a sense here. You know, some of your graphs had something like thousands of crashes, mm -hmm. right? And you found two vulnerabilities. So mm -hmm. how, what, what's the work that uh, uh, effort that is involved in trying to go from, you know, uh, how much work did you spend analyzing these crashes to get down to these CVEs? Is it days, weeks, mm -hmm. months? Mm -hmm. Interesting question. So most of the crashes that we get, uh, we actually try to filter them out, right? So we see what signal was actually given for that crash. Uh, if, for instance, we find that the uh, crash is interesting, there's a signal, there's a segmentation fault, then we are, we are actually interested in looking further into it. In, in such cases, we try to see whether the vulnerability was reported before, and for that, we need to have a POC for the vulnerability and check the execution trace. Uh, if not, probably we found a new vulnerability. Uh, so I can give you something like one week after we have the result. In one week, we can get a sense of whether we found something new or not, or what, was, what we actually found. Thanks. Um, Zephyr from UC Irvine. Um, uh -huh. Very interesting work. So I'm wondering um, if my understand correct, you run um, you run the fuzzing on top of an emulated device. So if there is there any case that the real device must be used? For example, the device has some the hardware has some internal states. Mm -hmm. uh, that's actually an interesting question. So uh, what we do with emulation, we try to say okay this hardware would run like this. So we expect the emulation to be correct. If the emulation is not correct, then that's another issue. Of course, we can say that the result is not trustworthy. I can see some cases that running on hardware would give us better results, but I'd say that if the emulation is correct, in most cases, we should be reliable enough. Yeah, for example, I.O. device, like a camera. Right, so for camera as well, right, so you can, Yes, as I said, you cannot guarantee that the results are the same, but if you correctly emulate the behavior of the camera, like the effects on memory, yeah. if there's a vulnerability, you can find it. Yeah, thanks. Hey, this is Tim from MIT. Mm -hmm. uh, when you say firmware and firmware images, does that include the original kernel that runs on the device or just user space binaries from the file system? No, the kernel as well. Thank you. Sure. All right, let's uh, thank Ali again.